<clears throat> okay, so let me go to the second part of the talk. I am Prabhanjan again. Uh, this is on, uh, from FE combiners to still Prabhanjan, yeah. From FE combiners to secure MPC and back. Um, so now, so we saw how to use MPC techniques to get FE. Let's see how to use FE techniques to get MPC. Okay? So in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, certain efficiency measures of MPC protocols. Um, I'm going to focus on two efficiency measures, namely round complexity and communication complexity. Um, round complexity just measures how many rounds you need to interact in order to securely compute a function. And communication complexity just deals with how many bits do you need to exchange in order to securely compute a function. Okay. Okay, and the goal of this work is going to be to simultaneously optimize both round complexity and communication complexity of secure MPC protocols. And to keep things simple, I'm only going to focus on passive security, and I'm only going to work in the all but one corruption model. Uh, and the main tool I'm going to use in this construction is that of uh, function encryption combiners. Um, so what are function encryption combiners? So we have these different constructions of FE from different assumptions. Right? And let's say you want to use uh, a secure FE construction. Right? So which of these assumptions do you believe? Um, so maybe you start with the first FE construction, and later it turns out to be insecure. So what FE uh, a combiner allows you to do is to combine these different FE instantiations, these different FE candidates, into one secure FE candidate uh, with the guarantee that um, the resulting combined FE candidate is secure as long as any one of the original FE candidates were secure. Okay. Just clear? And an alternate perspective of FE combiners is that they're even useful if all the original candidates I start off, started with are all the same. Okay? So what does this even mean? Let me explain this by an example. Suppose, let's say, you have a server that has the master secret key and public key of a Nefis key. Okay? And whenever you want a functional key to be issued, you talk to the server, and the server gives you the functional key. The disadvantage with this is that there is a single point of failure. If the adversary corrupts his server, then he can learn the master secret key. He can decrypt all the ciphertext and get the information. Okay? So a natural approach to overcome this problem is to sort of distribute trust. Right? So now you have many servers. And each server will have its own instantiation of the FE scheme. So the first one will have MSK1, PK1, second one MSK2, PK2, and so on. Right? Um, now, the conundrum is which public key will you use to encrypt? Right? I mean, one advantage with this is that the only way the adversary can actually learn all the secret keys is to corrupt every single server, uh, which might involve more effort to do. Um, but this, uh, the disadvantage is that what is the public key you're going to use to encrypt? Right? Maybe you start with using the first public key, but what if the adversary has already corrupted the first server? So here is where FE combiners are useful. Okay. So you're not going to use any individual public key. You're going to run the FE combiner on all the public keys, and you're going to uh, encrypt with respect to all the public keys. Okay. Okay. And the guarantee here is that the combined instantiation is, uh, is secure, as long as there exists at least one instantiation uh, of the original FE scheme that is secure. So recall that I'm still using the same FE scheme throughout. Right? It's just that I'm running different instantiations. Right? Um, so, so here the guarantee is somewhat different from the traditional guarantee you would have seen in FE combiners, uh, in that the resulting uh, instantiation is secure as long as the adversary cannot obtain all the secret keys of the original instantiation. So what is the relationship between FE combiners and secure MPC protocols? So I can really view every invocation of the FE scheme as being a party in the secure MPC protocol. And if the ith invocation of FE is compromised, I can consider the 
analogously, the ith party in the MPC protocol as being corrupted. Okay? So this is this is how uh, FE combiners are related to secure MPC protocols. And I'm going to use this uh, analogy to construct uh, MPC protocols. Okay. okay, so let me state our results. So we, we are going to initiate a formal study between secure MPC protocols and FE combiners. Um, and we are going to show how to get a two-round MPC protocol with communication complexity that only grows uh, polynomial in the depth of the circuit uh, and the input and output of the uh, of the circuit being securely computed and this protocol is secure assuming learning with errors okay. Okay. and the main tool used is, is in this construction is the tool of uh, FE combiners okay. and concurrently uh, Willie um, uh, Ortec and Daniel also obtained this result via the tool of laconic functional evaluation. Okay. okay. So before our work, the prior two-round secure MPC protocols were either based in the CRS model uh, or they had large communication complexity. Okay. So our protocol is in the standard model. Okay. So what about the other direction? Can we use secure MPC protocols to construct FE combiners? And we show how to use constant round MPC protocols to construct FE combiners for polynomial size circuits. Um, and the, the constant round MPC protocols we are going to use can be based on the existence of PRGs in NC1. So we get FE combiners for polynomial circuits from uh, PRGs in NC1. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this theorem uh, in this talk. And we can instantiate PRGs in NC1 from DDS learning with errors and so on. Um, our result is a little more general. We can we identify a class of MPC protocols that actually imply FE combiners. So in a sense, we give some equivalence between FE combiners and a class of MPC protocols. Okay. So let me jump into techniques. So we are going to use a large communication tour on MPC protocol. And then we are going to combine this with FE combiners and succinct single key FE schemes to get a low communication to our MPC protocol. Okay. So our transformation is going to be generic. And all these three different things can actually be instantiated from learning with errors. So we get the final result also from learning with errors. OK, is it clear? So before I show how to achieve our result, let's uh, recall how the low communication MPC protocols look like. So typically, uh, this is the framework used in constructing low communication MPC protocols. There is a CRS. And every party encrypts their input with respect to some public key that is derived from the CRS. And these encryption schemes, uh, this, uh, the particular uh, encryption scheme uh, used in the literature is called multi-key fully homomorphic encryption. But for this talk, you don't really need, need to know what it is. And once they compute the ciphertext, then every party broadcasts their ciphertext. And each party non-interactively homomorphically evaluates on this ciphertext. Um, and in the second round, they partially decrypt their final ciphertext and send the, uh, and broadcast the partial decrypted values to everyone. And using the partial decrypted values of all the parties, you can recover the output of the function. So that was in the CRS model, but you can adapt it to get a three-round protocol in the standard model, and the construction is really simple. So if you're the first party, then you are the one who's going to generate the CRS. Okay? And this is the semi-honest setting, so the, the party is always going to generate the CRS honestly. And the, sec the other two rounds are the same. Okay? So let's see how to go from three rounds to two rounds. If we do this, then we will get a low communication protocol in two rounds, which is our result. OK. So towards achieving this result, a natural question to ask is if we can parallelize some rounds. Okay. So can we parallelize the first and the second round? Um, and the, we cannot. And the reason is because the public keys are derived from the CRS. So it's unclear how to uh, compute the ciphertext without even knowing what the CRS was. 
So then the other option is to parallelize rounds two and three. And here, it seems like if we were to do this, we would need a non-interactive decryption phase. And primitives like FHE are not useful because you know, you homorphically compute some ciphertext, send it to the other party, that person decrypts and sends the answer back. So it's sort of an interactive process if you want to obtain the answer, right? So FHE uh, and its variants are not useful to achieve non-interactive decryption. But it turns out that functional encryption is really useful if you want to obtain non-interactive decryption. Uh, because, you know, you send the encryption to all the other parties, and if they have this functional keys, then they don't have to talk to you. They can decrypt the answer by themselves and get the output. Okay, so here is going to be the warm-up attempt to get low communication MPC from large communication MPC using single key FE. Um, so there are N parties. They have inputs X1 through Xn. So here is what they're going to do. Uh, they're going to run an MPC protocol, and the functionality associated with this MPC protocol computes an encryption of X1 through Xn, okay, under master secret key MSK. Okay. So who computes MSK? The first party is going to be the one who computes MSK. Okay. So he's going to compute MSK. He's going to feed it to the MPC protocol, and then they compute the MPC. Uh, they compute the ciphertext under his master secret key. Um, and also, the, f the first party is going to compute a functional key associated with the circuit C that is being securely computed. Okay? And he's going to send the functional key to all the other parties. Okay? So how do you recover the answer? So all the parties are going to run the MPC protocol, get the FE ciphertext. They have the functional key, decrypt, and obtain the output. Okay? Okay? So for correctness, I already argued. So if you have the FE ciphertext, FE key, then the correctness of FE implies that you'll get the correct output. What about the round complexity? So uh, a couple of years back, uh, BL and GS showed how to get MPC uh, for arbitrary uh, for poly size circuits in just two rounds. So you can just use their two round MPC protocol. And moreover, the uh, the FE key generation phase can be parallelized, right? So the, the first party will compute the functional key and send it alongside the MPC protocol being executed. So you only need two rounds. What about communication complexity? So what, what is being communicated by the parties? So the communication complexity is essentially the communication complexity of this MPC protocol and the size of the functional key. And uh, the size of the uh, and the communication complexity of the, the MPC protocol essentially is gross polynomial in the encryption complexity of the FE scheme. Okay. So the communication complexity is essentially computational complexity. Oh, it's again not working. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, it's essentially computational complexity of the FE encryption plus the size of the functional key for C. Okay. And we want both of them to be polynom group polynomial in the depth of the circuit. And we are going to use a succinct FE scheme to achieve uh, both these goals. Okay. Okay, so a succinct FE scheme allows, gives you uh, an FE encryption, uh, an FE scheme with encryption complexity that grows only polynomial in the depth of the circuit. Uh, but unfortunately, the size of the FE scheme in the succinct FE scheme grows polynomial in C. Okay. Okay. But what would have been ideal is if this only grows polynomial in the depth of C. Right. But this is too, uh, too strong um, as property to achieve anyway, because if you're generating a functional key for circuit C, then of course the size of the key is going to go, grow proportional to the size of C, right? So let's weaken this property. So we are going to start with an FE scheme that has uh, some structure on the FE key. Okay. Um, so the FE key, FE keys uh, will be split into two parts. The first part will consist of a short private string, and the second part will uh, will consist of a long public string. Okay? 
So we require this short private string to be computable uh, using the master secret key of the uh, of the of the FE scheme, but any party can actually compute the long public uh, public string. Okay, even if he doesn't know the master secret key. Okay, so why is this useful? This is useful because the first party who knows the master secret key can compute this short string, and all other parties can compute the long public string a public string on their own. So now, the only thing the first party has to communicate is the short private string. Okay? So the communication complexity only grows proportional to this short private string. Okay? And it turns out that the FE scheme of GKPVZ has this property, that, that the FE, key, FE keys can be split into two parts, where the first part grows only polynomial in depth of C, and the second part is polynomial in the circuit size. Okay? Okay? So, which means that we get um, the desired bounds for both these complexity uh, uh, complexity notions. Okay, so now we have communication that grows polynomial in depth of C. What about security? Um, so I'm running out of time, so let me just explain this very briefly. Uh, this is no longer secure because the first part is the one who is generating the master secret key. So of course he can decrypt the ciphertext and know all the inputs of the FE scheme, right? Uh, so what we are going to do is to make all the parties generate the functional keys and not any individual party, right? And we're going to use FE combiners to combine all these different invocations of the FE scheme. Okay? Okay. So as I said earlier, every single party generates the the, the FE functional key, and then you're going to feed in all the master secret keys into this MPC, uh, MPC scheme, right? So how do you recover the output of this protocol? So you're going to run the, you're going to run the reconstruction of the underlying two-round MPC protocol to recover the FE encryption of X1 through Xn, uh, and then you're going to combine all the FE keys generated by the different parties. Uh, you're going to decrypt the combined ciphertext using the combined FE key to get the desired result. Okay, to conclude, we get a two-round MPC protocol with communication complexity that, uh, that's only proportional to the depth of the circuit. And what I didn't talk about was how to construct FE combiners from PRZ, CNNC1. Any questions? <laughs>